So first things first, I am very happy and rather old to be invited as a keynote speaker to this conference, especially that while uh, my work is uh, various and it's often connected with the spheres of everyday life in Greece and Rome, I am not a game specialist. I will talk about that in a moment. Um, but now, uh, I am really looking forward to learning more. Uh, and I would like to present my, um, my way of seeing things and my analysis of certain aspects um, of the presence of games in a broad cultural sphere of ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with a quotation from a classical article, almost 100 years old now, which is sadly mm, still valid. Uh, the study of classical board games offers a most fertile field for conjecture, yet at the same time yields a distressing paucity of certain fact. And that unfortunately is still true. There is a, an entire group of problems mm, for those who, yield, who, who, who decided to study uh, ancient classical and Greek board games and gaming in Greece and Rome in general. The first thing are the sources. They are often ambiguous, they are often uncertain, they are often difficult to date. So uh, we may have a board from second century AD but whether we can apply a description of rules 700 years earlier to the very game of which the board we have, it's a different thing. Then there are no detailed descriptions of the rules. And that's probably because they were so absolutely obvious to everyone that no one really describes them. Then there's another thing. Mm, this is a relatively young field, even within classics. You may think that uh, among those who study classical Greek and Roman culture, everything has already been looked at. Uh, that is and isn't true at the same time. Games together with aspects such as astrology, magic, magical texts, amulets, uh, started to be of interest for classical scholars relatively late for a reason which is worth studying uh, by itself. It seemed not serious enough for the classical world. Since the Greek and Roman world was seen as a, a paragon, a model, of um, the society, of culture, something that is widely taught at schools, those aspects were believed to be on one hand too trivial, on the other somehow dangerous, somehow spoiling this perfect image. So this paper from 1933, this is basically uh, more or less the time when the serious uh, studies on the mm. archeological remnants mm, and literary remnants of what we know about games in antiquity started. And that is in an all, at all by himself, by itself another problem because the majority of studies concentrate around the, those material remnants, the study of cultural practices, of the meaning of, uh, of the games, of their presence in various spheres of cultural life, have been rather neglected, actually are still neglected. And the great comparison is actually sport. If you think about the sporting sport events in Greece and Rome, they have been studied uh, from a multicultural and multidisciplinary perspectives. There's been studies on the material remnants, on the importance, on the values of sport, on the connection be between sports and certain um, elite practices, uh, sports and aristocratic versus democratic way of life. 
there have been studies about all the importance of sports terminology for, for example, St. Paul uh, and his, um, his diction. All this is still to be done for the sphere of games. And that's a lot of interesting things to do, which I would try to show you in my presentation. My perspective here is not that of a specialist in game studies. I am not that. I am a gamer, um, rather passionate. I'm someone interested in the functioning of what we would today call popular culture in the spheres of antiquity, of ancient Greece, ancient Rome. But I am first and foremost a philologist, so and a specialist in cultural studies. So this is the, the approach I am taking. I'm looking at the material that we have from this particular perspective. I hope it, it's interesting for you. Mm. And I have some sources at my disposal. And those sources are, as they often are, in the case of uh, Matthew, of private life, of everyday life in classical uh, Greece and Rome, they are fragmentary, they are poorly preserved, they are not often understandable. Uh, we are lacking certain crucial pieces of information. We are lacking certain um, data that would make our life so much easier. Um, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of things that I could do, but I can't due to time constraints and due to the, um, the focus of this particular presentation. Uh, I will not discuss the game practice and rules. It can be done. There are reconstructions. Sometimes we have a few um, different reconstructions for the same game and their, its rule. Uh, I will not discuss the history of Greek and Roman games in detail. This is a fascinating topic, both the way they connect to the earlier practices of Egypt, of Mesopotamia, uh, the interrelation of Greek and Indian gaming practices in the Hellenistic period. So after Alexander the Great in the uh, third, uh, second, first century um, BCE, uh, as well as the afterlife, so to say, of Greek and Roman games, the way they survive both in Byzantine tradition and in the Western tradition, finally uh, somehow contributing to the modern understanding of, of um, board games and table games of all kinds. So this is all very interesting, but I can't really um, I can't really discuss it all in 40 minutes. So this I leave for some other time. Actually, some of it I already discussed at the seminar a few years ago um, with the um, Polish uh, Institute for Game Studies in Krakow. Uh, and one more, just one more methodolo methodological remark concerning this presentation. It is illustrated with some of the artwork and some of the preserved objects that can be connected to the games and gaming in antiquity. Some of them are for purely illustratory reason, just to show you how it looked like, how it could look like. Some of it I will use as um, some of it I will use as illustration to what I'm talking about. And this is exactly the case of this quite interesting image. It's very old. Uh, it's ninth, ninth century BCE, so the so-called Dark Ages of Greek culture. And it illustrates quite nicely one particular problem uh, that we have uh, that we have with uh, the sources for Greek and Roman games. But let us start this with the discussion, short, brief discussion of literary sources. The first question is whether we can always treat what we have at face value. For example, you have a description of something, for example, a game taken from comedy, Greek comedy, as everyone who ever saw a play by Aristophanes would know, is exaggerated. 
is satirical. This is like ancient Monty Python, more or less. So the question remains to what extent we can treat this kind of evidence at face value, what can be an, an addition connected with the genre in which we can find this description. The same is with moralistic texts. If a moralist gives you people obsessed with uh, the game of dice, shall we really believe everything that he says? And another thing, um, you know that the classical scholars often have this question that they ask each other or they ask students, if you could, what, which one of the lost literary scientific works of the ancient Greeks and Romans you would like to keep? And let me remind you, what we have is around 10% of what was written. So from the perspective of a student of games, the answer is only one. Uh, we would like, if, if I had a time machine as a student of games, I would go to, the, uh, to Rome, more or less at the time of Emperor Hadrian, so second century CE, and I would get a book a little book written by Hadrian's secretary, a noted historian and biographer, Suetonius, who, in addition to all the other things he has written, has composed a little treatise called On Greek Games. This was supposed to be a, an encyclopedia, a compendium, a, a companion uh, to the most popular games um, of Greek origins, known also in Rome, together with descriptions of how you play it and some mythological and cultural remarks. This treatise, unfortunately, is lost and it would help us a lot if we had it. We don't. There are some chances that maybe, possibly, because um, things can sometimes be found and lost texts can sometimes resurface. We had such an example a few years ago with a lost um, fragment, large fragment of Sophocles. So we can quietly hope that possibly one day we shall have it until we have it. We are at the sea with some problems, especially with something I mentioned before. Uh, the fact that rules of the most popular games were so commonly known, they were so omnipresent in the society that no one bothers really to describe them. Because why would they? It's enough to mention that they played Latrunculi. You don't have to describe to a Roman what a game of Latrunculi is. It's so absolutely obvious. So they don't. They don't describe it. And now we are trying, <laughs> painstakingly trying to reconstruct those rules that were so obvious that were never really described. Then we have archeological sources. And with archaeological sources, so with the physical remnants of boards or games or fragments of, of, um, of any kind of things used for playing, there are two questions. One is the fact that some of those findings are accidental. And if you think about it, okay. So because we have around a hundred um, preserved um, boards for Latrunculi, it says something about the popularity of the game. This is not accidental. But sometimes we have a fragment of a game and we are really not sure if this is something local or something more popular. Has this been preserved because there were many examples and one of them survived or is it pure accident? Then there's another thing which is quite common with archaeology. Mm, it's the problem of interpretation. And what you see here on this picture is the so-called granary game. We are actually not sure if it's a game at all. This is a model, a small, strange object, 
painted in so-called geometric style, which together with the place of finding would date it for some time in the ninth, possibly the beginning of the eighth century uh, BCE. The shapes of it re resemble um, the representations of granaries. There is no way to tell what was the purpose of this object. And it was proposed that it's a, it's a part of a game, but we are not really sure. Uh, there's no description of such a game. There are some, um, there are some uh, similar traditions possibly in the Middle East. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's something completely different. So in some cases, we can't really tell what is that thing that we are dealing with. Mm, so these are the problems, but luckily for us, apart from the problems, there are also some interesting things to be analyzed. And I would like to talk Mm, first about the meaning, cultural meaning of the games as reflected in the myths of the founders. So who, who invented games, gaming as a practice and games as such, why were they invented and uh, what was their interpretation around the time they were, um, they were originated. So basically we have three in the sources, uh, Greek and Roman sources, we have three groups of possible founders for games. So it's either gods or men as uh, individual personages or peoples or nations. Uh, the most commonly mentioned god founder of games is Hermes or actually Hermes in his Egyptian incarnation as thought. We have this information in possibly the most influential author describing games that is in Plato. Um, as a part of his, um, of his statement concerning uh, the cultural interconnections between Greece and Egypt, uh, when modern scholars discuss um, or recover somehow the knowledge that uh, Greece was not an isolated cultural phenomenon, that there were close connections with Middle Eastern cultures, with North African cultures, the Greeks knew it. Uh, they knew it well. Uh, they were aware of it. Plato is one of the sources for it. Mm, so he mentions Hermes. Mm, so the god of cunning, uh, the god of thieves, the god of travels, but also the Hermes Tchonios, so the god of the underworld, as a founder of games. Then if a founder is named as not a god, but a man, one name reappears over and over, the name of Palamedes. Uh, he's mentioned as of games, probably already in a epic poems uh, that were composed just after Homer, so very early, 8th, 7th century. They are not preserved, we don't know them, but we have mentions concerning them, and that's where the name of Palamedes appears. I will talk about him in a moment because there are many parallels between his myth, his life in mythology, and the fact that he is considered to be a founder of uh, the practice of playing games. Then in Herodotus, there is a mention that um, the idea of playing games was invented by Lydians, so by the nation of Lydians and their king Attis. Mm, who are the Lydians? They are the people from uh, one of the regions in Asia Minor. And this is interesting because this once again would prove that there was some kind of awareness of 
the connection between Greece and Middle East that the Greeks knew that some of their inventions, like the invention of a game, both the game of dice and board games, uh, is connected with what other peoples already had, is not really um, purely their own, that they are aware of a certain continuum in, uh, in the practices, in this uh, particular example of the gaming practices. So now let us look at the gods of gaming and at the men, heroes inventing games. So if you look at the picture here, um, you will see a rather interesting image of a divinity. Uh, there's a god barefoot but with winged feet, with wings at his back and very long hair. In uh, the majority of representations, he would also be bald um, at the front, so he would have his head shaved apart from the one long uh, braid at his back. Uh, and he's carrying scales in his hand. This is Kairos, the god of chance, one of the patrons of games and gaming. Uh, named a patron of games because this is basically a god of good luck and of a passing chance. This is someone who runs uh, very fast, as Greek poetry describes him. Sometimes he's flying on his winged feet, sometimes he has, um, he has shoes with little wheels added, so like the, like the roller blades, more or less. And he runs, uh, he runs really fast and you have only one chance to catch him. So an apt patron really for the games of chance such as dice. Another patroness of games is Tehe. So Tehe is the goddess of fortune. She's a Roman. She's better known under her Roman name Fortuna. So the goddess of, of charms and of fate. Not only of the good fate, basically of fate as something changeable. Mm. So when you consider that Tehe Fortuna is a goddess of gaming. This puts games uh, within a sphere, typical for Greek culture, a sphere of things decided by fate, blind fate, and at the, si as at the same time by God will. This is a paradoxical goddess because on one hand she's a goddess, so she has her own will. She decides certain things for humans, for nations, for states. But at the same time, she is a personification of blind chance, blind good or bad luck. And as such, she is a very apt patroness, once again for the games, especially the games connected with luck, such as the omnipresent in Greek and Roman culture game of dice. Um, I mentioned already Kairos, and let me just mention that another important patron of games is Aphrodite. Uh, she's not, and as of course, as uh, as is Aphrodite. When when we have Aphrodite, we usually we usually have also her son Eros Amor. So Aphrodite, Venus, and Eros Amor are important patrons for games, and. If you think about it, the connection between love, luck, and games is not uniquely Greek or Roman. It appears in a number of cultures. Uh, there's a saying, I think, quite popular in a few cultural spheres that your luck in games means that you're unlucky in love or the other way around. Mm, the Romans had, and the Greeks, had a very strong connection between this goddess, her offspring, and the practice of playing. Uh, once again, mainly the practice of playing dice, where in Roman game of dice, uh, the luckiest and the highest possible score is called the throw of Venus. Um, this is this this is this is this happens when 
uh, each of your dice shows a different number. Uh, so you have the full the full set of numbers. This is the most uh, uh, the most lucky uh, possible throw. Now uh, these three gods, so Tihe, Kairos, and Aphrodite, are mainly associated with playing uh, the games connected with luck, such as dice. If you think about board games, they are connected most often with Hermes or they are connected with a human founder whom you can see here on the 18th century representation um, by Antonio Canova. Uh, there are some Greek, uh, some Greek images of Palamedes, but none of them, none of them connects with this part of his life that we are interested in here. Uh, Palamedes is very often viewed as the one who first imagined the need for playing a game. And he is in many ways an anti-Odysseus. They are very similar in character. They are very similar in nature. But their careers um, and their, should I say, their lives are in many ways opposed and actually the most important myth of Palamides is the myth of his deadly feud with Odysseus. So he's a hero, a grandson of Poseidon, so from the, from the divine line of the god of the sea. And the main myth concerns the fact that they were, they were all supposed to go to the Trojan War, Odysseus, who had just married, and he has just become a father, didn't really want to go, so he pretended to be mad, but Palamedes saw through his ruse and exposed uh, the fact that he was lying. Odysseus never forget, forgot and never forgave that. And soon enough, he fabricated evidence that Palamedes has been parleying with the Trojans. So Palamedes, who was absolutely innocent in that matter, was um, judged, he was proclaimed traitor, and he was uh, killed as a traitor. That's the main myth, the most popular myth, but that's not what we are interested in here today. Although to some extent we are, um, Palamides is gen generally, he's what we may call a culture hero. So a hero founder, much more than he is a hero warrior. He is a hero founder who invents a lot of things. A myth says that Hermes has invented some of the basic letters, Palamides, wanted to write more um, precisely added new letters to it. Um, he is believed and he is presented as a master of riddles, both of composing riddles and of guessing riddles. And he is someone who can always find, or almost always, find his way out of impossible situations. Uh, he is someone who is called upon when a situation of a city or a place is um, very difficult. He is believed, he was believed to, uh, to be of help in such cases. And um, at some point when he was commanding his armies, he realized that the soldiers are very bored during the breaks in the in the fights and if you think about it the combat especially during a siege is in greek times it is in a way organized you don't fight at night you don't fight at certain parts of the day there are moments when you fight there are days when you don't uh, so he decided that to raise the morality of his soldiers, he has to find some kind of diversion for them, to keep them ready for battle. 
So he invented two kinds of games and Sophocles in a fragment of one of his lost tragedies, possibly the tragedy called Palamedes, obviously, says that he invented the games Pesu Kibute, so the game of Pessoi, which is uh, more or less checkers. This is a this is a very general remark, and uh, it would it would take another presentation to explain what Pessoi really is, and the game of Kuboi, which would be more or less the game of dice. So both the game. Um, both the game uh, based on strategy and the game based on pure luck are attributed um, attributed to him. And as you see, I have enumerated it here in uh, something understandable, probably mostly for philologists. Sophocles, Euripides, um, the Athenian philosophers and sophists such as Gorgias, they all mention Palamedes as the one who invented those games. So the connection between him and gaming is very strong. Uh, here you have the, the judgment of Palamedes. I mentioned the moment when he was accused of being a traitor. Here you have a judgment of Palamedes by Rembrandt. Palamedes is kneeling with his shield. The person with the scepter in his hand is King Agamemnon who will condemn him to death in a moment. And uh, in Greek literature, in Roman literature as well, uh, there is a strong connection between the way the life of Palamedes is described and the way they understood games. Palamedes is a master player. Mm, it's a master of getting out of impossible situations yet even he, at some point, loses. He's, is, he's skilled in a number um, of spheres, but his skills mean very little because Tikhe, the fortune, is against him. Uh, this fortune that is cruel and unpredictable, he had no way of knowing how uh, his life would turn up. And despite, this, uh, despite of being completely innocent, he still was executed for a treason he never committed. And at the same time, if you think about it, when the achievements of Palamedes as culture hero are enumerated, are mentioned, games go somewhere between new fighting techniques and uh, um, an invention of new letters for the alphabet. So they are part of civilization, the civilized sphere. Uh, the fact that they are invented to alleviate boredom and race morale, so they are used to create order out of chaos, which is a typical um, a typical uh, action of a hero in big culture. They are very strongly situated within this sphere of, of civilization, of uh, achievements of civilization. It will not always be so, especially in Roman culture, um, where a strong ethical objections against gaming will be raised. I will talk about it in a minute. Now, uh, but this also happens actually in Greek culture, where games are not always seen as ethically neutral, especially because they are often viewed as a part of aristocratic lifestyle, of elite lifestyle, which would of course mean that they will be used uh, as a point of critique in uh, social and cultural struggle that is crucial for the development of Greek police in the 7th, 5th century before Christ. Mm, so in the rising, one could say, police democratic movements. Um, I am being reluctant here because uh, Greek polis, so the Greek city-states, are not always democratic. 
um, in a, what, uh, even in, in the Greek meaning of the word, but certainly, even if a police is ruled, say, by a tyrant, this is something different than a rule by aristocracy. A Greek tyrant is a leader that has a support of lower classes. So whatever the, um, the political institutions in the police, the conflict between the rising, um, rising police uh, leaders and the old the traditional aristocracy is something culturally and historically quite important for that period. And if you think about it, uh, the games, the playing of the games is very often seen as an aristocratic pastime, which would fit with the Homeric model. And also as the pastime of someone who is wasteful, who is who cannot really control himself, who overdoes things. And that is important for one reason. If you look at a classical Greek um, set of values, the highest valued um, ethical quality is what the Greeks called sophrosyne. And sophrosyne means literally being reasonable, but the best translation would be self-control. The ability to stop yourself, especially stop yourself in the face of pleasant things, not to give in too much. And basically, this is very old, this association. It's older than the city-state, actually, because the first description of this kind we find in Homer. Uh, so this is almost the beginning of the Odyssey, the first book, the first scene after the meeting of the gods. So the Odyssey starts with gods meeting and Athena saying to Zeus, hey father, it's really enough, let the poor Odysseus go home. Zeus allows her to intervene and down she comes from Olympus to Ithaca the home world of Odysseus, to the house of his wife Penelope, where the suitors, who are generally the villains of Odyssey, the suitors are sitting idly. They are sitting on the heights of the oxen which they had killed, so they have taken something that was not theirs, and uh, they have killed and eaten oxen belonging to Odysseus and his son, they have now, they are now using the heights to sit on them and they are playing the game in front of the house. So they are doing nothing. They are using up somebody, somebody's resources. They are basically doing what young Greek aristocrats would be accused of doing throughout uh, the existence of uh, Greek culture and later on through Roman times. And this is the beginning of Greek literature and this is the beginning of this kind of association. In Homeric times, it is not yet political, but it becomes politicized, should I say, uh, in the later period when the idea of playing a game, especially playing a game for money, becomes synonymous with uh, being idle, being wasteful, uh, wasting one's natural talents and abilities. Um, there is, as I said, a strong political connection with the concept of gaming. And playing a game is often linked with politics or compared to politics. I'm giving you here two examples. One is from the biography of a famous philosopher, philosopher Heraclitus, who, uh, who would not believe that just politics is possible, who would all believe that politics is just a game of chance, and who would show it when asked to write um, a set of laws for the city of Ephesus. He retired to the temple to play games, and when the Ephesians asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you not writing the laws for us? He said, well, guys, it's the same. There's no difference between politics and the game of 
dies. Uh, and then you have something which is arguably one of the most famous passages in the entire Greek philosophy. The statement of Aristotle that um, a man is a political creature, uh, that a man is a zoon politikon, so a city of police, not uh, an individual, not a not a single uh, not a single piece but a part of a structure and for this very very famous fragment he is using excuse me Alexander. Actually, sorry that that's 40 minutes um, okay yeah okay so if okay you're beginning wrapping up that'd be great thank you all right so I'll, I'll just finish this little piece and then i'll wrap it up okay so someone who is not a part of a police is a police, which is a nice Greek word for without a police, but it's also a police is a single piece in a game called police. So you can see that without this metaphor or with the use of this metaphor, which is usually lost in translation, this passage gets additional meaning. Politics is a game but a single piece cannot do much. Only if we are together, the police, both the game and the city can work. Now, let me mm, just skip this uh, games and death association. And let me just go to my summary, which is here. And um, what seems quite obvious, even from this shortened, shortened version of my presentation, is the terminology, phraseology, meta metaphors, and imagery that is taken from the sphere of games is omnipresent culturally in Greece and Rome. It is used for a number of purposes and it is used in a number of contexts. Uh, the comparison of life and game is strengthened by the fact that certain particular gods and heroes, as you are used, are interpreted as inventors of gaming. And that the main spheres in which we can find images, words, and metaphors connected with gaming are three. It's politics, public morals, and the sphere of death and dying. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't bore you to death and I would very much welcome questions. Thanks a lot.